Zelda nerds, it's Alan. Everyone really liked my Zelda home automation video, and I want to thank each and every one of you for watching and sharing and subscribing. You're the best. You are, specifically you. A lot of people have been requesting a tutorial, so in this video we're going to do a close-up look and an overview of the hardware and the software I used for the Zelda system. This isn't going to be a step-by-step -step tutorial, so if you're an absolute beginner, if you've never touched a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino before, I'd say go level up a little bit and then come back here. And I know someone out there is wondering, so don't worry, part three of making a lightsaber is coming out next week, I swear. I know some of you have been waiting for what probably feels like decades for this video to come out next week, I promise. But for now, let's take a closer look at the Zelda system. This is the ocarina I used. It's a pretty typical 12-hole ocarina. It is Zelda themed, which is really cool. It's not mine. I'm actually borrowing it from my new roommate, Tyler Murray. Tyler's got a YouTube channel called uh, Island Arcade, and he's got a series of videos where he talks about the Hawaiian origins of Pokemon Sun and Moon, and he actually goes to Hawaii on location and talks about how real-life things relate to Pokemon Sun and Moon. Uh, Tyler's helping me film stuff and edit things and he's lending me his ocarina, so all I can do is pay him back in shout out. So make sure you check out Island Arcade and subscribe. I guess he got this in like a secret Santa on Reddit, but I'm sure if you look hard enough you'll find a 12 hole ocarina that's also Zelda themed if you want something just like this. And this is what the Zelda home automation system looks like when it's out of its tube. You can see it's mostly a Blue Yeti microphone. If you do anything on YouTube you'll definitely- oh! I guess I played a song with my voice. <laughs> this is definitely overkill. Uh, if you just get any kind of crappy USB mic, it should work. I just used this because uh, I had it lying around and I didn't want to buy a new mic. This is a Raspberry Pi 3 Model B. This is a crappy speaker I got from the Dollar Tree because it literally only has to play one sound. The body of the tower itself is a 4 inch diameter ABS drainage pipe. This is actually a piece of scrap pipe that I had in the garage. Uh, it's really dinged up and doesn't really look good until you get some gold spray paint on it. The high rule symbol actually makes it look really cool, which I'm really happy about. The thing is, I only use this for the video so that it would look sort of like Amazon Echo, and that's just sort of a visual shorthand so that people watching the video for the first few moments sort of already get an idea of what's going on. I wouldn't recommend putting everything in a tube. I would just have it lying out or in a nice project box because when everything is in a tube, it's just a bundle of wires that you can't get to. You have to like reach your hand in there to fix anything. Um, it looks nice, but I wouldn't recommend it. You can see there's four yellow LEDs. Each of these LEDs uh, represents one of the like yellow arrow buttons. <laughs> they correlate to the different notes. Each of them is connected to one of the Raspberry Pi's GPIO. It's one GPIO pin to one LED. That yellow wire you see there actually connects to the blue LEDs. All of these blue LEDs are connected in parallel. The pinouts and the notes they correlate to are all uh, in comments in the code. The important thing to remember when you're choosing your own LEDs is to have resistor values such that uh, you don't draw more than 16 milliamps of current from any of the GPIO pins, and from the total GPIO pins, you don't draw more than 50, 50 milliamps of current. So even worst case scenario happens, something goes wrong in the code and all the LEDs turn on at once, they're still not gonna draw more than 50 milliamps of current from the Pi, and that's important so you don't fry your Pi. You'll notice this clear thing that actually holds the Blue Yeti in the pipe. This is a really cheap piece of Tupperware that I got from the Dollar Tree too. It just so happens to fit perfectly in the four inch diameter tube. The Blue Yeti has this sort of lip around the microphone and it comes out enough to hold onto the inside of this circle if you cut a circle inside of the really cheap Tupperware. This is the Python code. I was having a lot of trouble writing my own Fast Fourier Transform stuff, so I stole everything from here. Make sure you check it out. You'll want to make sure that this here is the uh, whatever directory your, your confirmation sound is. A lot of the comments mentioned that they want to hear the Zelda songs being completed the way it is in the game after you play the first six notes to hear the rest of the song. I didn't do that because I felt like it would just add a lot of padding to the video and I wanted it to be a shorter video. Obviously, if you want to do that, you could make your own sound objects here using Pygame and call them later on when, when uh, the correct song has been detected. These frequencies I determined by using Audacity 
and using the uh, spectrum analyzer tool so I could look in the frequency domain. And this, these are roughly the average uh, frequencies for these different notes that I was playing on my ocarina. Um, a lot of people pointed out, and they're totally right, this ocarina is not very tuned at all. <laughs> Moving on, make sure that your sampling rate here matches the sampling rate of your mic. The original code um, in the website that I showed you up top uh, has this set to like 4400 I think and with the Blue Yeti mic it actually results in a buffer overflow because your sampling rate doesn't match in the software and your hardware. So that was that was something that took a little troubleshooting. Make sure this matches the sampling rate of your mic. Pretty much all of this stuff I just straight up stole. <laughs> Saria's song is a little different. It doesn't even um, publish anything over uh, MQTT. Um, what it does is it utilizes this website called ifttt.com, which stands for If This Then That. It's a website that allows you to just connect all kinds of different electronic internet things. It's not limited to this, but how we use it is we use a, a maker account, which allows you to trigger an If This Then That event. With our maker account, we just make a post request to a uh, URL with our key. Obviously, mine is not here because you will want to keep yours to yourselves. When that happens, it triggers a phone call. And you can set that up in ifttt.com. You can also set up things like text messages or emails or tweets, all kinds of things. It's, it's a really easy just way to like glue weird internet things together. And I've posted uh, one of the tutorials that I followed for getting started with Maker and IFTTT uh, in the description. All of this is available on GitHub, and the link to that is in the description. Here's the Arduino sketch that I used to program the uh, Node MCU clones. Up top here, obviously, you'll want to fill in your own Wi Fi network name and password and IP address for your Raspberry Pi if you're using a Raspberry Pi to act as a MQTT broker. This is probably a bit sloppy, but I mean, all, all of this code is pretty sloppy. This same code is uploaded on all of my Wi Fi modules. The only difference is that up here, the character song is changed to a number that correlates to which song that module should be listening for. Since each of the ESP8266 modules are their own clients, you have to make sure that along with changing the variable song, that you have to change this here, which is the unique client name for each of the modules. And again, I've come to doubt uh, the names that I've used. They're arbitrary, you can you know put in your own. So just like the comment says, this section is do the thing if your song plays. This is the ESP8266 development board that I ended up using. It looks like a clone of the Node MCU dev board. Um, this is probably like a Chinese clone. I got this for about $7, but if you're okay waiting for shipping all the way from China, you can get them for even less. So the first module here, the one that's activated by a uh, Zelda's lullaby and locks and unlocks the door, you'll notice it's actually powered by six AA batteries. This is clearly just for demo purposes. I do not leave this thing on to actually lock my house because as everyone in the comments pointed out, I showed everyone how to open my door and plus these batteries are going to die in about a day, less than a day, if I leave it plugged into the ESP8266 module. If you're going to try and replicate this at home for continuous use, uh, definitely find a way to plug this into a wall or at least use the ESP8266's low power function, which it definitely has. So if we publish the character 8 with the topic song ID, we'll see that this actually toggles the servo between unlocked and locked. You'll notice the servo has a little bit of bounce at the end because the way it's attached to the lock, there's actually a lot of pliancy. That's part of the design so that if anything does get stuck, it's not going to damage the servo. But it also means that we want to bring the servo a little further than we have to and then sort of bring it back to a neutral position. That's all handled by the uh, Arduino sketch. Here's the Epinus song module, the one that unlocks my car. Uh, you can probably hear the servo jittering right now. This servo has actually been through a lot. This servo was an actuator for one of the butterfly valves for our terrible spy car in episode 7 of Mythbusters The Search where I was eliminated. So at least I got a servo. The body of this is again made out of some scrap quarter inch poplar that I had. You can tell that parts of it have been laser cut before. This lever is on a hinge. It's maybe six or seven inches long and it just provides something that the horn of the servo can push against to press the unlock button on the key fob. 
here on the lever is a screw that juts out and it lines up with this button so that when the servo horn presses down the lever, this screw pushes the unlock button on the key fob and, lock, and unlocks my car. There were a lot of comments asking why the Song of Healing didn't relock my car, and it's because this module can only unlock my car. It's only got one button press. The Song of Healing really only affects uh, the lights, the uh, door locking and unlocking, and the thermostat, because all of those modules have states that can toggle between one or the other. You can see that if we take our laptop and we publish the character 7 on the topic song ID, the servo simply presses down the lever and then goes back to its neutral position. Boy, that is twitchy. This module is plugged into the wall. It's uh, got a wall wart that supplies 5 volts at 2 amps, so plenty of juice to keep the ESP8266 happy and the servo at the same time. This can be left on continuously. Here's the Song of Time module. It's a cheap Chinese talking digital clock attached to the ESP8266. Uh, the original button that made this thing talk is now connected to one of the GPIO pins here. When it goes high, the clock says what time it is and the temperature. That'll happen if we publish character 2 on topic song ID. This was something I kind of threw together last minute because I knew I just needed something to activate when the Song of Time played because it was from the game Ocarina of Time. I couldn't really think of anything better than this talking clock, and honestly, if you really want to, you could probably just make the Raspberry Pi a talking clock and not have this separate module altogether, but I felt it flowed better with the video if I had something separate uh, away from me to actually activate and talk. This is the relay module. Each of these relays here uh, turns on and off one of these outlets. Each of these is controlled by one of the ESP8266's um, GPIO pins. So this is the only module that controls more than uh, one of the devices in the house. One of the outlets controls the lights for the Song of Song. One of the outlets controls the uh, water pump for uh, Minuet of Forest. And then two of the outlets are actually used to turn on the humidifier because I ran out of extension cords. Out of all the modules, this is the one that the comments talking about a fire hazard are actually correct about. There are just a couple of exposed places, namely these screws that uh, attach the wires to the relay board that are exposed to mains. So out of everything, this one's the one that really should have a cover of some kind the most. But again, it was just sort of a demo for a video, so this is not a finished version. If you build it yourself, you really should make sure that nothing that's directly connected to the wall is exposed. The power supply for this ESP8266 is uh, just like an old cell phone charger that I had that can supply 5 volts and 2 amps, so this one can be run continuously. Bringing my laptop here, if I publish the character 1 on topic song ID, turns on the uh, top left outlet, which I connect my lights to for Sun Song. I turn it off again by, again, uh, publishing 1 on the topic song ID. These two outlets on the right are controlled by one GPIO pin, and that's because the humidifier has both a PC fan and an ultrasonic transducer that needs to be plugged in, and the easiest way to do that was just to plug them each into one of these. So if I publish three on the topic song ID, both of these relays turn on, which turn on both of these outlets. I can toggle it off. If I publish four, what happens is actually this second outlet here will turn on for five seconds. That was just a good amount of time to run the pump to water the plants. It can be changed in the firmware for the ESP8266. So if I publish four, that relay will turn on, and then five, four, three, two, one. There we go. This pump inside is something I just got off of Amazon. It was something like $5. It's a small aquarium pump. Everything's pretty much connected with, uh, I believe it's quarter inch uh, vinyl tubing. These T-connectors here are for like a sprinkler system from Home Depot. I think my favorite part about this whole setup is the fact that these binder clips are what hold the tubes in position in the pots. It's just a really fun and simple hack. I love those sorts of things using uh, regular materials to do this sort of stuff. For some reason, this is what I got the most questions about. This is my humidifier. As you can tell, it's totally a DIY humidifier. I didn't want to get one from the store just for this video because it's like, 50 bucks, 30 bucks, and I'm super poor. So this humidifier is mostly a pitcher, again from the Dollar Tree, again, super poor. At the top here is a mini PC fan. It's uh, rated at 12 volts. It's currently running at five volts because at 12 volts it just blew too much air and you couldn't actually see the mist come out in the video. If, if you use a 12 volt one in real life, it probably will still humidify. It just will not look as neat. 
I actually had to modify the fan a little bit. You can see I sealed up these edges here with hot glue and then put a bit of a absorbent paper towel there because what was happening was if this thing was running for more than a few minutes, it would get wet inside of the fan speed controller and it would short out and stop working for a while. So be careful of that if you try and build something like this on your own. This is a bit of mesh that just makes sure that sort of the bigger sprays or droplets that come off the transducer don't make it out, otherwise you'll end up with a bunch of spurty wet spots around the humidifier. The thing that makes this whole thing work is this ultrasonic transducer at the bottom. This one runs off of 24 volts. It came with its own wall wart when I got it off of eBay. And it's nice to have around in case you need to do a project like this. It was originally for making uh, one of those fog screens, which I never got around to finishing. This module is a lot of fun. This is the thermostat module that's controlled by the Bolero of Fire. There's a little servo here that pushes this uh, switch, this lever, that turns the thermostat up or down. Unfortunately, I don't have a parts list for this one because it's just one of those things that I had in my um, electronics pile. I have no idea where it's from. The servo is mounted to the wall with some foam mounting tape, and then because of all the leverage from having to push this little slider left and right, it's also zip-tied around the body of the thermostat itself. Again, six volts from four double A's, not continuous use. Here's a closer look at the little servo and the servo horn. As you can see, it's just one of those uh, cross-shaped servo horns, and I had to wrap these up in electrical tape to make sure that it had enough grip and enough length to actually push this uh, lever around. Now we've actually logged into the Pi via SSH. Obviously, use your own IP address and password and login, and change it from Raspberry. Don't just go with the default. You probably aren't going to have to do this, but my Python modules are just such a mess that the only way I can manage them is by using a uh, virtual environment. So for me, I'm going to have to start that up now. Now I'll want to start Mosquito as a broker in the background. And I'll put it in verbose mode. There we go. None of the modules are on right now, so we're not going to see them as clients. Actually, here, I'll, I can plug in Epina Song. So we should be able to see what that looks like when one of the modules comes on and signs onto the... Uh... There we go. I'm going to go ahead and turn the Epina... Epina song module off, so we stop getting all those. And we see that uh, the Epina client has disconnected. So right now, from the command line, you can just publish different characters that will activate different modules, which is handy for a test. Let's go ahead and start our Python script. You'll get a bunch of warnings from um, using Pi Audio, and that's okay. So right now the the uh, <laughs> right now the Zelda home automation system is across the room from me, and just from talking, um, we're getting a lot of false positives because it does have a very uh, forgiving threshold for uh, the different notes. That obviously can be changed in the code uh, if it doesn't work for you. And notice that the uh, what the heck is that message that gets printed? Like I said in the code, is something that prints when it hears something that it can't categorize as any note, or if it hears a note and the note is sustained or repeated, that's when that'll print. I'll show you an example. I've got my ocarina here, and the microphone is really great. Uh, it'll be able to pick up a note from the ocarina even um, from across the house, but I have hardwood floors in the duplex I live in, and it carries really well over that, so your mileage might vary. So I'll go ahead and play a uh, low D, or, okay, so it's just registered, my voice is a low D, so I'm going to play an F. Okay, I'm going to play an A then. So notice that I've played the A note, and rather than registering the A note multiple times, uh, for as long as the note was heard, it just printed, uh, what the heck is that? That's so that I could avoid registering the note multiple times, since none of the songs I use uh, repeat the note. And the Zelda system is across the room from me right now, uh, so you may be able to pick up the confirmation sound on this mic. Let's give it a try. And it looks like it's lagging a bit. Uh, right there, right up there you can see test sequence activated. That means the system is hearing the notes properly and that it can execute commands based off of songs properly. To quit out of the this Python program, uh, you'll just have to do Command-C to quit, and the one thing about this code is 
Once you've quit out of your program, whatever your last note was will stay lit on the Zelda system, which, you know, might be fine. If you want to be really nice about it, you'll want to find a way to actually close the, that GPI, those GPIO channels properly once the program quits. Hey, you finished the video! Make sure you like it, and if you haven't already, consider subscribing. And if you do, hit that bell button so you get notifications. Thanks for watching!